Support for Short Stops is presented by the Kalem Trading Institute. Check out our website at www.kaleminstitute.com. On today's episode... Because that does happen. Traders say, you know, I'm a trend follower. Yes. I'm a momentum trader. Oh, we hear that all the time. We you do. hear that all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to try out for a baseball team. And I'm going to say, well, I'm a fastball hitter. <laughs> That's what I do. And I'm going to stick to my style because that fits my personality. Well, <laughs> good luck when you have a pitcher who throws breaking balls and off-speed stuff. Uh, the point being that you do have to adapt. Call it what you want, a game, an experiment, a gamble. But stock trading in the global financial markets to us is a business. Every day you're surrounded by the noise. Buy, sell, hold, buy more. And we're going to quiet it down and filter out the best trading strategies, tips, and stock picks. You want information on how to find your next bagger or home run? You'll find it right here on Short Stops. Welcome everyone. This is episode 27 of Short Stops. I know you guys have been missing Edmund for the last two episodes, but I'm not going to complain because I have been able to have the privilege to come here today to interview two legends who have influenced so much um, our experiences in CD Securities and in the Caleb Trading Institute. So I would like to introduce to you He is a clinical psychologist and a performance coach, Dr. Brett Steenbarger, and the co-founder of SMB Capital, one of the biggest proprietary trading desks here in New York, Mr. Mike Bellafuri. So, hi guys. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, record this podcast with us. We really appreciate the effort. I know the market is open right now and uh, you have your own work and in terms of trading traders, I know you're focused on about 60, is that correct? Yeah, we're watching what they're doing right now. <laughs> right on the eye, that's amazing. <laughs> well, you have a smile on your face. That's a good sign, Mike. We're, we're, we're doing well today. Given, good, given good. Uh, the good. market conditions. Yeah, so. so if I get up and run out of the room, that may mean things have changed. <laughs> yes, especially if he's screaming. <laughs> so. Dr. Steenbarger, you have authored multiple books on trading psychology. I'm an academic psychologist. Yes. I taught for 19 years full-time at a medical school. I still teach at a medical school. So my background is as an academic psychologist Mm -hmm. who works with high-performing individuals. And it started with medical students and residents when I was doing student counseling. And it's grown into working with traders and portfolio managers in financial markets. Uh, But my background actually is in psychology and in uh, teaching psychology. And how did you dip your fingers into trading? I actually started trading in the late 1970s, uh, which is well before Mike was born. And, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, in the late 1970s, while I was in graduate school, I uh, became interested in trading and so traded equities mm-hmm. uh, while I was in graduate school and just kept that interest, but it was always as a side interest. And then finally put those together when I wrote the first book. Wonderful. I appreciate that you think I wasn't born in the 70s as of yet. But I was. <laughs> you were! Mike, you are also um, an author of two very important books in terms of how we deal with our work in city security. So that is One Good Trade and The Playbook. I'm just curious, how did your paths come across? What was the context of that meeting? Actually, Dr. Seenbarger uh, suggested and encouraged me to write a book and put me I in see. touch with uh, his editors. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, I could curse at him for that because writing a book <laughs> is very difficult. It was, it was a great experience. And the thing that's really rewarding about writing a book is people like yourself reach out to people like us and want to chat. And we get to meet people that we wouldn't just meet if we were just traders Agreed. on a desk. I right. understand, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so I wrote uh, Wonga Trade and, and the playbook, and we started SMB in 2005. Yes. And, uh, we have known Dr. Steenbarger for a long time, uh, and he's been uh, helpful and instrumental in helping us grow our traders uh, you know, for almost 10 years now, um, it, informally and informally. Yes, yes, it's been quite a while. And one of the things that led me to reach out uh, to Mike and Steve and, and the firm here was that I saw that their main interest was in training and developing traders. Yes. 
And that's what I do in medical school, right? You know, it's developing physicians. So I really value education and training and doing it the right way. And I saw that um, Mike and his team had a commitment to doing that. And so that's how we ended up connecting. And eventually that led to uh, Mike's writing his book and other and good things. That is also the reason why we are, we from a third world emerging market are all the way out here because of the books that you've written, the blogs well, thank that you. you've shared, the videos have been so instrumental in what we do. And one question that has always been on our minds because um, our chairman, when he started the prop trading firm, he asked himself this question as well, because the truth is, is that as an individual, we all know that developing our own personal trading skills is difficult enough as it is. Why did you decide to take on the task of training multiple people to be able to do what you do? It's purpose. So I had traded my own account for a long period of time and I saw this opportunity in the marketplace that uh, wasn't being serviced, okay. which was when I started, I saw how people were trained. And then in the middle 2000s, I saw uh, lots of people who I had traded with pushed out of the game, unable to ad adapt. The market got much harder. And I didn't see uh, even the firms that were uh, still succeeding, I didn't see them offering a, a development plan that was necessary okay. for the harder, more complicated markets that were present in 2005-ish. In, in okay. And so I had this idea that if we really focused on training people from the beginning the right way, mm -hmm. that we could build out a great firm. And I didn't see other people doing it the way that it should be done. And that was something that was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, what if we were to come along and make it easier for somebody to start right now and uh, give them a better chance of succeeding and you know, building a culture that was important to us, to Steve and myself, you know, what could we do? And we thought we could build the best prop firm, we thought just from that idea, mm -hmm. we could build the best prop firm in New York City. Because traders kind of, some of them don't stay in the game for as long as they think that they, they can. Uh, markets are always changing. Um, but we, that was our purpose. Let's build the best development desk out there and use it as a way to build the best overall desk in the city. And I think you mentioned that before, that you could take in 10 traders, but you can't guarantee that all of them will be able to succeed. Yep. Yes, absolutely not. I, it's definitely not 100%. And you know, we know from research that with day traders, overall, the hit rate for long-term success um, is under 5%. Wow. So it's not even 10 out of 10. That's 1 out of 20. Um, so the key question, and, and, as I, and as I've said before, though, I mean, that's not surprising. What's the hit rate for professional golfers who make their living from golf? What's the hit rate for professionals who sing and dance and can make a living on Broadway? You know, it, it, we're talking about elite performance. When someone can trade and make a consistent living from their trading, that's elite performance. Yes. By definition, the elite is not 10 out of 10. So the key question is, can a proprietary trading firm increase the odds, the baseline odds of success from that 5% to something much more meaningful? And I think that's what, in different ways, Mike and I work on. And we do, if I may say so. We, we do. No I mean, there are the, the amount of resources that you get when you come to a proprietary trading firm is vastly superior than to you just trying it by yourself. And, you know, oftentimes I'll talk with people who are having some success on their own as independent traders and, and retail traders, and they've heard of the success that some of our guys have and and that success being many multiples of what they're doing yes um and and often you know i'll say to the people it's it is tremendous that you're having 
this much success, even though it's many multiples lower than the best traders here, Yes. because you, you don't have the resources that they have, you don't have the buying power that they have, which really makes a difference. It does. You don't get to work with Dr. Steve Barger. <laughs> oh, geez. There which makes a tremendous, there's the edge. <laughs> which makes a tremendous difference. Uh, you know, and, 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 and uh, I know you're being humble here, but you know, we, yeah. we just worked with, it was one trader um, that we, is very important to the firm going forward. And we identified uh, a process that they weren't going through mm -hmm. that when they then went through it identified their strengths and their weaknesses the trader uh, started keeping really good stats tagging their trades measuring their trades keeping really good good stats and working with Dr. Steenbarger to see where their failures were and where their successes were and from those stats can construct a plan to, to move forward effectively. And you might be an independent trader without those resources and just keep flailing away exactly. with the talent so yeah. true. to be able to do it because you have good in your trading, but, but your losses are overwhelming the goodness. Yep. And you know to have somebody who coaches the best traders in the world look through your work and point you in the, not just the right direction, um, but the effective direction, the, the game-changing direction is is, is, a, is a resource that very few people get to have. I mean, let me, let me jump in here, because I'm gonna add a layer to what Mike is saying, uh, and it's an important layer. So yes, this trader did look at their statistics and really benefited from learning about their strengths. Who was the one who went over their performance up to that point and pushed them to look at their statistics? Who was that person, Mike? That was me. <laughs> that was Mike. But this is really important because it's not just coaching. Coaching is really important. It's the integration. This is a major point for, for your session here. The integration of mentoring and coaching. Someone who can work with the trader as an experienced trader and someone who can work with the trader as an experienced coach. And the ability to put that together, you have someone like Mike who has all this experience. He was saying, going back to the 90s, I wasn't even born then. <laughs> <laughs> going back all the way to the 90s. Yeah. So here's this really experienced trader saying to this relatively new trader, you know, you know, this isn't working for you, you need to look at this, you need to look, you need to keep stats, and then they can come to me with those statistics and I can help them make sense of those. One point that I, I found was really interesting when I read One Good Trade was that you said, Everyone assumes that the best trader is also the best teacher, and you said that that's not true. Do you? Th I mean, I read the book, but I'm sure some of our listeners may not have necessarily. Could you expound on that? Because I thought it was really yeah. Point. And you said this in Chicago. I thought yeah. you made this really good point um, about how we all have our own strengths, and you know, part of what we're all supposed to do is figure out what our real strengths are and uh, tap into them and, and highlight them. And so the skill of trading, pushing the buttons in real time, is a very different skill than being able to teach and coach and mentor somebody, get to the next level uh, in their trading. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're just different skills. And what makes somebody a great trader who can push the buttons in real time uh, is different than what can help somebody progress and grow uh, and improve as a trader. And now certainly, and, and Dr. Steenbarger would, I'm sure, you know, I've heard you say this a bunch, you, you need to have traders at the firm who are succeeding, who are doing well, who people can copy. And a role good model. Yeah. role model, and a good first step is to copy the masters, as, as you like to say. But then, to traders will go on to make things their own. So you you, de you do need that exposure to very real edge mm -hmm. from a, a, a really prosperous trader. Um, but you also might need somebody to be a good teacher. Be a good teacher. 
Um, and so there might be another layer that we sort of add to this in terms of what we're doing right here, which is traders join teams. And when they join teams, they're working with senior traders, seeing their edges, seeing how they're trading in real time. And then they have myself as a coach and Dr. Steenbarger as a mentor on, on top of all that that's, that's helping them progress. And I will say that the best trader at our firm um, is pretty good at just about anything. Okay. But what's interesting about the traders on his team, and they actually, as I think about it, I'm pretty sure they all are profitable. Mm -hmm. They all watch what the trader is doing, that the, the, the elite seven-figure trader is doing in real time. Um, but, and they're all, they're all kind of trading the same stocks. Okay. And they're pretty much mostly trading in the same direction, but they all trade differently. Really? So Very they've all true. been exposed. I, I know them personally. I see their stats totally differently, and yet they're inspired from the same source. It's very interesting. Most of our listeners, our following, the majority are independent traders. Uh, very few are actually able to work for a proprietary trading firm. Um, based on your experiences, both of you, do you feel that one is necessarily better than the other? Is there a huge advantage of working for a prop trading firm versus trying to do it on your own and having access, of course, like we do to your blogs, to your, to your, to your material. Is that enough? Or do you think that there's something added with joining a prop can, trading can, firm? Can I, can I uh, first respond and then uh, Mike can uh, chime in if, if he sees it differently? To me, it's not, the issue isn't being an independent trader versus a prop firm trader. Okay. The issue is what are the odds of your success mm -hmm. and what will maximize the odds of your success. So, I want to be an independent athlete mm -hmm. and make it to the Olympics. Well, by odds, that's not going to happen. Okay. Because the people who make it to the Olympics get coaching, they go to camps, yes. they train, and they need that support system. You know, I'm going to independently be a successful surgeon. Well, <laughs> that's not going to happen. You need a medical school training and then a residency training, and you need multiple mentorships uh, to develop those kind of skills. So being an independent trader, what are the odds that you'll reach that elite level of success, and how do they compare not just to a generic prop trading firm, but to a firm that is dedicated to curriculum, education, training. And training is important. And I'm just thinking about my own kids. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. When you said that, I, I think of them. And so my son, for whatever reason, really loves to play basketball. Okay. We wouldn't just put him out there on a a, a black top court and let him progress by himself. I mean, even at five, he goes to programs. Yes. He, even at five, he is going and doing the types of things that five year olds are doing to get a little bit better. Mm -hmm. They go to swim. You know, they want to swim in the summer by themselves. We wouldn't just throw them in the water and say, figure it out for yourselves. And so, you know, one of the things that I think independent traders uh, think is, I'll just figure it out for myself. You know, I don't need to spend a whole bunch of money uh, investing in training because you know, the best traders are just born. And uh, you know what we see from the traders who've been successful here mm -hmm. and uh, even outside of here is that there are commonalities amongst them. And having a really solid educational foundation, no matter what type of trader, people go on to be is is key. Being able to manage risk, being able to understand what moves markets, being able to find your own niche, um, understanding technical analysis, understanding how to use technology to make more money, understanding how to find the right stocks, mm -hmm. prepare, prepare for the day, review for the day. Those things are first. And, and we see when traders are gonna be really big, they become consistent first. I should say first they, they have to learn, they have to go through a development process, but then they become really consistent. Okay. And you can't become consistent if you don't have a really solid foundation. And if you 
aren't consistent first, then you're not going to become a big, big, big trader. You go through a foundational training program. Now, what is everything you need to learn about markets to make good trades? And then there's a part two to that, which is being exposed to different types of setups, different types of strategies that traders on our desk are implementing to be successful. And exposing traders to those different types of setups and then asking them to experiment with them, record their stats, try them out, see if they work. If they do work, then start to put them in your playbook. My second book is called yes. The Playbook. And the idea is you build your business around a playbook. Okay. So that second part of, of training is exposure to different types of setups, momentum setups, pullback trades, breakout trades, market plays, etc. The stuff trade, we have all these fancy names uh, and quirky names for the, for the trades. And you try them. You try them for a week and, and, and you experiment with them. And if you like them, you, you archive those setups and you put them in your playbook and you work with them a little bit more and then you move on to the next setup and you see if you like that setup. And if you do, then you put it into a, a playbook and then maybe you try another one you don't like it so you forget that one and you move on to another one. But the idea is people are being exposed to setups with Edge and then they're finding out which ones work best for them. Um, and as Dr. Steenbarger says really, really well, you, you want to trade strategies that build upon your cognitive uh, and your uh, emotional strengths, your psychological and your cognitive strengths. Mm -hmm. And you want to be building that playbook, not just around somebody out there who makes the most money, because somebody out there who makes the most money you may not be able to trade like that. Those setups may not be best for your cognitive and for your emotional skills. But there might be, and there's different people out there trading different in, in different ways. And so you wanna be exposed to the different ways you can make money and then choose for yourself the path that you're gonna to take to, to grow as a trader. You know, one of the guys who's, we're really excited about into the end of this year and, and, and for next year, I remember when he first came in to talk to us about bumping up his risk in a particular strategy. And I remember being really uninterested in talking about bumping him up in this particular strategy because I didn't actually think it had a lot of legs to it. Okay. And he put down his trading stats in this particular strategy in front of Carlton, our floor manager, and myself, and the equity curve was just you know, gorgeous. I mean, it was, it was just beautiful, it was mm -hmm. straight up. And you know, he's sitting there asking for more buying power, and Carlton and I are like, of course we're gonna give you more <laughs> buying power. Um, and you know, he's kept, and, and he trades a way that, that's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a specific niche, and you know, again, at first I was like, can you really like build a, can you really build a career out of this? And he's kept trading it bigger, trading the strategy bigger, trading the strategy bigger, trading the strategy bigger, making more money, making more money, uh, then slowly creeping into other ways to make money that are similar to this unique niche, and then teaching people, and then teaching people such that the, the guys under him are really starting to, to progress. We're seeing great progress this month from, from some of the junior guys. And so, you know, you don't wanna be the guy who says, you have to trade like this. Yeah. You know, if I would have been that, that, that teacher who was like, no, you've gotta trade like I do. You know, or you gotta trade like Shark does, or you mm -hmm. gotta trade like Swang does. You know, who knows what would have happened to that particular trader. Yes. Um, but we let him do what he wanted to do, and he got exposure to something that had edge and, and, and ran with it, and I'm as excited about his team as any other team on the desk. Um, and so, it's, 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 it's that breadth of exposure and choosing what's best for you that, that I think it's missed sometimes in, in, in trading education. You mentioned that there are different personalities. You have to work with different kinds of individuals. All their trading styles are obviously not going to be exactly the same. I, I also read in one of your books before was that you are integral in terms of the hiring process as well. So can I, can I ask what exactly is your role? How do you hire traders? How do you determine whether they are a good fit 
for SMB Capital and what are the what is the criteria involved? Okay, well, I work as a consultant with SMB, yes. uh, and I also work with other hedge funds, money management organizations, and yes. in some cases help them with their hiring process. And, and the idea is to help them understand what goes into success, encourage them to study their best traders, and then use that information to help them ask the right questions and select for the right things with applicants. And you're, I mean, you've always mentioned um, that trading is a performance sport. Can you expound a little bit on how you choose who you want to recruit for SMB? No. <laughs> That's proprietary information. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. So, uh, so Dr. Seenbarger did help us study some of the people that have done well here and we have a distinct culture here that's important to us. I do think if you walk the halls of SME Capital, you should notice something different about our traders and even our top traders, which is they're trying to get better. Okay. They're not talking about just their P&L. They're, the best traders aren't satisfied. Even where they're at, they're pushing for more, for better, for improvement. Um, so, you know, we, we start with, we gotta have people fit into that culture. Yes. So sometimes athletes are, are a good fit because they have a history of delayed gratification, they have a history of working at things to get better. Um, but sometimes athletes aren't a good fit because they don't have some of the other characteristics. Uh, processing ability, interest in trading. Yes. I wrote in One Good Trade uh, about a particular former athlete who we hired who did have that really good buy-in to, to the culture that's important to us of work at something and you will then get better at it, mm -hmm. um, and had done that as a college athlete in basketball, and uh, came to trade with us, and very clearly and very early we recognized he wasn't interested in trading at all. You know, he was, you have to, you have to, you have to really want to learn and, and study trading. And so, yeah, for us, we want people that are interested in trading. Generally, that means they've done it before. We want people who want to try and grow and get better. We talk a lot more these days about having some coding skills to use the technology that we have here. Um, certainly, people who are even-tempered are preferred. People that are conscientious are preferred. So we have a whole list. We're not going to give you all of them. <laughs> that, that, is right. your, that is your secret to hold. Uh, based on your books, you've mentioned that even their personalities outside of the office is something that you look at in terms of uh, simple things is being on time, not being late for work. Yeah, as I get a little bit older, I, I have uh, become a little bit more open-minded to the different ways that people can become successful. Okay. I can tell you that conscientiousness is a large factor in success, but I can also tell you that some traders are just different. You know, there's one particular trader on our floor who's just different. He just, he learns differently. He's not gonna sit down and write out a bunch of notes on his trading, but he will go talk to lots of different traders about his trading and about their trading and that's his, that's his way of studying. He's not gonna come in at 7.30 ripping through a bunch of research reports. It's, it's, not, his, it's not his thing. But he does work hard in his, his own right. Um, He's more, conscientious in a different yeah, way. in a different way. And so if I were to sort of say, you have to get in at a certain time to this one particular seven-trigger trader, that wouldn't really work for him. Um, It'd be like saying you have to trade in a certain way. Yeah. Yeah, you have to let people be who they are. Uh, and people can have different ways of being creative, different ways of being conscientious. I, I have a, so I have another question. Does the bottom line, the seven figures that you're saying, can they use that as leverage for them to, perf to not necessarily to follow all the rules, assuming that they bring the results to the table. Yeah, but they are, so the, the particular, particular trader is following the underlying rules. The okay. underlying rules are... Their rules. rules. And that gets back to what you were talking about earlier, Mike, is, is people learn their own playbooks. Yes. 
And so they develop their own rules and they're much more likely to stick with their rules because it's their rules. It's not something that Brett said or that Mike said. It, they develop their playbooks and it's their rules so they own it. And I think that's why they're more likely to stick with it. Yeah. Uh, look, at the beginning, when we hire you and we expect you to do a training program, you don't show up on time, that's a problem. Okay. okay? That shows a lack of seriousness. Yep. Um, that shows a lack of respect for the investment that we're, the massive investment that we're making into you. Massive investment. Not just in, in monetarily, but in time and, and all the technology and resources that go into it. Um, and, and how important, I mean, that seat is a, a very valuable seat that I'm lots sure. of people want to have. And so if you can't show up on time, we don't, we're not going to have a lot of tolerance for that. Mm -hmm. But as you mature and develop your own playbook and your own way of working at markets and reviewing, there's latitude for that. The, the guys, but, but the best traders work at it and, and differently, but they work at it. With every trader, their setups are different. Those setups that work for them are different. Their personalities, once they, once they start trading, is, you know, it's not the same. But you mentioned that the ability to adjust to markets is so critical into the success of every trader. Does that mean, let's say for example, you are a momentum trader, or this is the kind of environment that you work with as is, but the environment changes that is not necessarily fit for you. What do they do then? How do you, I mean, you mentioned that you don't mandate how they trade, right? You cannot tell them that you have to do this, this, this. Yeah, yeah. let, let me jump in, because that does happen, traders say, you know, I'm a trend follower, yes. I'm a momentum trader. Oh, we hear that all the time. We you do. hear that all the time, mm -hmm. yeah. And so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna try out for a baseball team and I'm gonna say, well, I'm a fastball hitter. <laughs> That's what I do. And I'm gonna stick to my style because that fits my personality. Well, <laughs> good luck when you have a pitcher who throws breaking balls and off-speed stuff. Uh, the point being that you do have to adapt to different conditions and we're seeing that in the equity markets right now. Things are much more volatile than they had Absolutely. been uh, in recent years, and uh, an uptrend has been uh, nicely broken. Uh, so we have to adapt uh, to those things. And what that says to me, and this is something Mike, you and I have talked about, is that it's not enough to provide education mm -hmm. to traders. We have to have continuing education. That's what we see with physicians. There are new technologies that come out. There are new, there's new research about different approaches. You know, th these days we're doing microsurgeries where we used to open the person up. You know, all that technology is now available. That takes continuing education. Mm -hmm. Physicians have to get a certain number of continuing education credits to stay licensed. So we need to provide continuing education for traders to help them adapt to changing market conditions. Uh, and that's what I think uh, has been successful. We're doing that right now. So exactly. normally we trade what we say our stocks in play. Okay. We look for specific stocks that have unusually good news or unusually bad news that's been unexpected by the market. And our thesis is you trade those stocks because they offer more opportunity than other stocks. Yes. That is normally what we do. In this market, when volatility, and you've said this, when, vol when, when VIX hits 15 and you're an active intraday trader, you need to think about trading the overall market like it was a stock in play. We have VIX above 20 for most of this month. So what we're counseling our traders to do, and this is challenging, because their expertise is trading stocks. What we're, what we're encouraging our traders to do is to trade marketplace, mm -hmm. to trade SPY, Q, IWM, VXX, UVXY, TVIX, to, to trade these instruments where we would normally say, don't trade them, they don't move enough, you're just gonna get chopped up. Mm -hmm. and, and these traders have had to take the leap into these products that they don't trade that often and figure out how to trade them well. And so Dr. Steenbarger will talk to them about 
and he was a futures trader and is a futures trader uh, presently, and so has some some really good insight onto. And I think always people always think you're a, you're a trading psychologist and you work on people's minds. And right. what he really does is work to help people gain edge. Mm -hmm. And so an example of that is, okay, we've got a trade marketplace now. Here are some indicators that you've never really looked at that much that if you look at, will help you trade marketplace better. And let me point them out to you. And so uh, the, the traders on the desk are, you know, even, even seven figure traders who are really good trading stocks in play, you know, some of them are not that good trading marketplace and some of them are really using this present market regime to improve on their marketplace overall. Look, the best traders are gonna get better and, and, and do well even when you, you shift, but they, ha you know, they have to shift over to it. They have to trade these other, they have to trade these other instruments. And you know, we're seeing this internationally as well. And I'm seeing this with other traders at other prop firms who understand that they need to do more of what they were doing to, to trade these markets overall that they're a little bit uncomfortable uh, doing. Um, but some of the traders have done pretty nicely. And, but it's, it's, it's a learning process for them. The next time we see a high volatility marketplace, they'll trade it a little bit better. The next time after that, they'll trade it a little bit better. But yeah, I mean, the, even but you're the, always a student, yeah. you're always learning. Mm -hmm. Even the experienced traders, you know, they're learning new things, and that's part of what keeps it interesting and exciting for us because they're always learning. Yeah, and and you know, one of the biggest challenges with trading marketplace in this market environment is is not just uh, how to uh, identify good longs and and good shorts, but but the added wrinkle in this marketplace is that you actually have to trade them move to move. The, yes. the traders that, not, so not only do you have to trade market products this month in these products, but you, you have to also trade them on a tighter and shorter time frame than you do even with your stocks in play for a lot of these guys. And so there's that added complexity and adjustment that, that, they, have to, that they have to go through. What's really interesting is that you mentioned that consistency is so critical in terms of trading development. You have four stages, is that correct? I'll go through some, I'll go, go through some stages that we sort of see. The first stage is, is learning. Yeah. And the, a, another step is consistency. And then uh, when we see people who are consistent, we want to have them trade bigger from the trades that they're doing well and try and trade a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. And then the next stage after that is we want to see traders expand their playbooks. Okay. Uh, and then the next step after that is to be more sophisticated in how they express their That's edge. Yes. In equity trading, that means trading options. So how do I structure a trade with options that gives me a little bit more exposure to my idea and, and, and also maybe gives me a, a longer time frame that uh, can help me supplement what I'm underlying doing with my trading. Okay. And I'll just add one <clears throat> little observation here. You know, we talk about stages as if it's a linear progression, but in fact, what's happening as a trader becomes consistent and then they start getting bigger, once they get to the point of getting broader and once they get to the point of being more diversified, different ways of expressing trades, they go back to the first stage, which was learning. And so it's, it's not just this linear progression that the, the traders succeed and then they go back to being learners. Yes. And that helps them become broader. That helps them learn about things like options. And they succeed at that and then they become a learner in a different way. How, how do you measure, sorry, how do you measure um, consistency? Is there a weight? I mean, is it just you're, you're batting 100% with every trade? You should be making money with every trade or is there a different way of seeing it? Statistics? We can yeah, statistics. Um, Risk-adjusted returns. How much money are you making per unit of risk that you're taking? Uh, you know, that's an important measure. Uh, so and all of your guys need to keep track, right? You got, they, they keep their journals, you have your records of yeah. every trade. So they keep the stats, they upload all their trades, it spits out all of their stats, okay. time of day, how do they do, how are they doing in a particular stock, how are they doing over the week, how they, they tag their trades, how are they doing in a breakout trade, how are they doing in a momentum trade, how are they doing in a market play trade, how are they doing on a stuff trade, how are they doing on a low flow trade. 
and they'll they'll see those numbers uh, start to come out because they ultimately they do want to grow their trading they want more buying power and they know to get more buying power they have to demonstrate some objective success yes and, and so that's what the statistics will show I will say that independent traders if you if you talk to them uh, a lot of times so if, if you go talk to the better traders on the desk, they will be able to tell you where they make most of their money, the types of trades they make most of their money in. Very true. If you were to go talk to an independent trader, they probably, who wasn't doing as well as they want, they probably couldn't answer that question. They just don't have the resources to be able to track all their trading in a tagged way um, as happens here. Right. And if they did that, they, that, that could be the reason Mm -hmm. that's holding them back from being profitable. Just, just, that, just that understanding just of... Yep. My last question, yep. um, given this, this environment, um, how do you deal with traders who are losing money psychologically and uh, in terms of getting them back on their feet? Because our experience back home is that usually once they have a major drawdown, they tend to kind of immediately lose focus. It's, it's a little hard for them to get back into, you know, to the grind. So in terms of mindset, what is your advice? Yeah, and, and this is another area where being part of a trading firm is valuable because there's something called risk management. So I'll, I'll do a shout out to Carlton here. Um, but people don't go through major drawdowns okay. because there are risk limits on the day and there are risk limits you know, over time. And so that protects the trader psychologically mm -hmm. so that you don't have to get into the situation of, oh my gosh, they've lost so much money, can they ever come back, can they ever succeed? You're proactively addressing that through the risk management. But the big question is, if they're losing money today, this week, this month, are they losing money for the right reasons? Mm -hmm. In other words, in a process sense, are they doing the right things? Because we know that returns can't always be consistent every day, week, month, and so forth. And, and so uh, I think we deal with things as mentors and coaches very differently if they're losing money for the wrong reasons versus doing the right things that just don't happen to be working out at that juncture in time. I will counsel them to go back to being consistent, to focus on being consistent and then to drill deeper into that, what are their A plus setups? Make the game easier. So you're going through a period where you're not seeing markets well. Make the game easier, stick with your A plus setups, bring your size down, put up a couple of green days, Get your confidence back. Rebuild your yep. confidence. Yep. Make the game easier. Stick with your best setups until you have a, a series of green uh, streaks in a row. And I've seen that work very well with some traders, yeah. Do you ever believe there is such a thing as a hopeless trader? Not yeah. everyone has the skills and the ability uh, or the temperament to be a successful trader. I mean, hopeless. Uh, you know. Could, could I be successful as an NBA basketball <laughs> player? No, I would say I'm hopeless, you know? Okay. <laughs> I mean, that, that's just a realistic assessment, a rational assessment based on the fact of my stature, my leaping ability, <laughs> I am hopeless, okay? Yeah, so is there a hopeless trader? If you said there wasn't, then you're saying anyone can succeed at trading. Yes. And in a performance field, that's ridiculous. Not everyone Because there is a huge misconception that when people come in, <laughs> they say, oh, there's money in trading, so I just want to be a trader. And then they immediately assume that it's... it's and I'm going to jump in here, because there are a lot of bad guys in this industry who will try to sell services Absolutely. to tell people that anyone can be successful and you could be sitting on that beach placing your trades and you could be... You know, that is the dream. Of that is the idealistic dream. Yes. <laughs> that is not a dream. That is a fantasy. Okay. And uh, there are a lot of people who will prey on the hopes and dreams of people who need to make money. The reality is, even with the training, even with all the education, the number of people who make those big six figures, big seven figures, uh, is not going to be the majority of people. But we can meaningfully improve the odds of mm -hmm. those success 
with the right kind of teamwork, the right kind of mentoring, the right kind of coaching, the right kind of curriculum, uh, and that's the best we can do. And that part is not hopeless. I'm gonna to toss out a, a big picture idea. Sure, sure. And uh, yeah, I'd be interested in your reaction to it. We talk about traders continually learning. How many prop firms are there around the world that take training seriously? What would you guesstimate, Mike? I think you could speak better around the world. Well, not so much in the prop world. I mean, I have so much experience with hedge funds and so forth. Um, I know of some, but what, what would you guess, just by your own experience, that really uh, are invested in training and development of traders? Uh, there's very few really good prop firms as there is, even in New York City. You'd be yeah, people would I'm be surprised. Globally now, yeah, uh, I could name them. I wouldn't be able to fit them on my one hand. Okay, okay. Maybe you can fit them on both of your hands, but. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. It is a limited number. It sounds like Calum is trying to do this very thing. And, and I, do, I have encountered, and you and I have met some people globally yeah. who are trying to do these things. Wouldn't it be interesting if periodically we could get together as trading organizations around the world and share our best practices in terms of developing traders and what's working in the Philippines, what's working in the US, what's working in Australia, what's working in London, and you know, periodically share what we're doing that's working and how we're helping traders that uh, learn. That would um, be, I'm sure we would be able to learn so much more from you guys than you would for us, but either way, it would be a remarkable experience for that to happen. Well, yeah. I, I think that, so, so not only is each trader continually learning, but we as, mentors and coaches of traders were continually learning. So, food for thought, but uh, I think that could be a, an interesting development, as long as we meet at very exciting destinations globally. <laughs> <laughs> I just really want to say, before we end this, I want to thank you both profusely, because not a lot of people are as generous in terms of sharing their information, their time, and um, their knowledge about how to be able to trade stocks so freely. It's a complimentary um, exposure already for everyone across the world, globally, because obviously we're from the Philippines. We're, we are literally from a small island, you know, and because of what you have been able to do and what you've been able to share, we have grown tremendously. And I, I really need to thank you both. Well, thank you. Thank you. Perhaps the greatest part about it is that I read also in One Good Trade that you said 2008 was obviously a critical year for all traders. And um, you put a lot of heart into it because you said that even if you were making a lot of money in 2008, you had wished you were making money in a different manner because people were not, others were losing their jobs and so I on. I remember that and feeling. I remember feeling, just stop, just, just stop. Can we just make the market stop going down? And uh, it was, uh, and it was a weird feeling because here you are seeing these guys who are having new highs in, in P and L, and and breaking out and succeeding, and yet understanding what that really all meant, and uh, I really kind of just wanted it to stop. It's more than just the the money. Yeah. Well, one of my big trades when I was developing myself as a trader. I was uh, coming into the session really short, okay. and so I'm, I'm watching the pre-market, you yes. know, and the market just dives. I mean, I'm making a great amount of money, and I call a friend. I said, "What's going on?" You know, uh, some news obviously came out. Well, it was 9/11, and there was no joy in making that money. You because don't lose your humanity just because you're focused on making money as a yeah, trader. Because back home, I mean, we are exposed to media yeah. and to what we see on TV, and that's mostly it. Right? I mean, I'm sure a majority of people who are following Calum or City Securities, they, they haven't even had the opportunity to come here to see the reality. So what they see is like Wolf of Wall Street. They see people driving Ferraris. This is that it's more just material versus what you guys really actually do, which is there's a value to it because you know that you can make money not off of 
other people. You making money, you earning it, that's earning right. it through this industry. Not taking advantage. Not taking people. advantage yeah. of other people, and that's something that I re- resounds between the two of you. And I, I speak on behalf of our entire team back home that we really do appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both for your time. Thank you.